So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Martha Stroud and I'm the Associate Director and the Senior Research Officer at the USC Shoah Foundation Center for Advanced Genocide Research. And on behalf of the center and my colleagues who you'll see throughout this event, I'm excited to welcome all of you. So we'd like to begin by acknowledging that the USC Shoah Foundation Center for Advanced Genocide Research is located on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Tongva people, the traditional land caretakers of the Tovangar, which is the Los Angeles Basin and the Southern Channel Islands. Along with the Tongva, we also recognize the Chumash, Tataviam, Serrano, Kawia, and Peom Kawicham peoples for the land that USC also occupies around Southern California. We pay respects to their elders, past and present. So a quick note about the Zoom protocols. This is a special event because we're gonna have two presentations by our Beth and Arthur Lev student research fellows from 2020. So we're gonna have a couple of opportunities for discussion and questions and input from the audience. When that time comes, and we'll remind you then as well, you'll be able to type questions into the chat. You'll be able to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window to uh, share your questions, or you can use the raise hand button down there and ask a question live via audio. And we just want to encourage your participation, your feedback, and your questions, since that's always such a lively part of our events. And we're grateful for your participation. Uh, I should remind you that the event is being recorded and the video will be shared widely after the event. So if you have concerns about privacy, um, you should probably ask your questions via chat or the Q&A feature as opposed to live on audio. But we hope to hear your questions however you choose to answer or to ask them. So next week we have an event scheduled um, also on Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific time. And we invite you to join at that event. And you can always learn more about our upcoming events on our website. So now to introduce today's lecture, it's my pleasure to introduce the founding director of the USC Shoah Foundation Center for Advanced Genocide Research, Professor Wolf Grutner. Thank you, Marta, um, and uh, I thank everybody for uh, joining us today for, uh, for this presentation uh, at the Center for Advanced Genocide Research uh, of the Shaw Foundation. Uh, the center was founded in 2014 and developed a lively academic program, which consists of annual conferences, a speaker series, and fellowships. And um, the center has bestowed fellowships at all academic levels from very senior fellowships uh, until the undergraduate and uh, graduate student level and um, for today's lecture we are uh, happy to have two presentations from usc students one undergraduate and one graduate students who are both sharing the beth and arthur lev uh, fellowship um, and uh, we are really grateful to the donors of this fellowship because it enables students of usc or at USC to um, undertake original research with the testimonies of the Visual History Archive at the Shoah Foundation during uh, a summer residency at the center. This year, as in many cases, this was a little bit overshadowed by the COVID. And so we had uh, we could only enable a virtual residency, but we hope that this was uh, uh, equally um, uh, in encouraging and also advancing the research of uh, these really uh, great students uh, who will present today. And we, I'm saying this because um, it is a little bit unusual that students are doing these academic presentations, but what we learn from this, uh, from the possibility of the Beth and Arthur Lab Fellowship is that actually our students are really uh, capable uh, to um, develop creative ideas uh, to research the testimonies. And we are always amazed uh, about the research, uh, results uh, which they can produce in such a short amount of time. 
uh, doing their summer residencies. So uh, we have two presentations today, which are extremely different. And this was also what intrigued us uh, actually to bestow the, uh, or kind of give them, uh, these two students, the, uh, these, uh, the fellowship so that they share it. We have one presentation about women's resistance during the Nanjing massacre. And the other one is uh, uh, kind of exploring Holocaust testimonies to provoke or inspire an artistic response. So to introduce the speakers, I hand over to the center's uh, visual history archive research officer, Vadima Pitic. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Lucy today. Uh, Lucy Sun is a senior majoring in history at University of Southern California. She is the center's first research fellow to focus exclusively on the Nanjing Massacre collection. Lucy currently works as a research assistant at the USC Culture, Diversity, and uh, Psychophysiology Lab and at the USC Center for Religion and Civic Culture. She's a former research intern for Johnson & Johnson in Shanghai, China. Lucy is the recipient of the USC Academic Achievement Award and is on Dean's list. She's fluent in Mandarin Chinese. Uh, Lucy, the virtual floor is all yours. Okay, so hi everyone, I'm Lucy. I'm a fourth year student studying history and over the past summer I was the undergraduate Beth and Arthur Lev Fellow at the USC Shoah Foundation Center for Advanced Genocide Research. My research focused on women's resistance to sexual violence during the Nanjing Massacre. In this presentation, I'm going to provide historical background information on the massacre, an overview of current scholarship, my research questions, and then demonstrate how the Shoah Foundation's virtual history archives testimonies have been essential to the research. So in September 1931, Japan, whose leadership had its eye on China's natural resources, launched an invasion of China's northeast region called Manchuria, which is the region in pink. Japanese troops were able to swiftly conquer the region, as at the time, China was a fragmented nation in the midst of a civil war. Afterwards, Japan eagerly sought control of more Chinese land, so both sides anticipated a seemingly inevitable confrontation. As a result, China's nationalist and communist leaders agreed to suspend the civil war in December 1936 to focus their efforts on Japan. Then on the night of July 7th, 1937, a sudden exchange of fire between Chinese and Japanese troops on the Marco Polo Bridge between Chinese uh, on the Marco Polo Bridge in Beijing's southwest suburbs sparked a cascade of fighting in other areas of China, which ultimately escalated into the Second Sino-Japanese War. Soon, Japan was seizing city after city in northern China, and in August 1937, it forced a second front in Shanghai. After three long and bloody months of battle, Japanese troops captured the city. Immediately afterwards, the army in Shanghai set its sights on China's capital city, Nanjing. Wealthy Nanjing residents began fleeing the city months in advance. As they left the city in haste, the population of Nanjing city plummeted. It's estimated that approximately 200,000 to 250,000 of the original 1 million Nanjing city residents remained in the city days before its fall. The 200,000 to 250,000 residents who stayed behind were largely those who lacked the resources to uproot their homes. Beginning in November, Chinese government officials started to evacuate Nanjing as well. However, they ordered Chinese troops to stay and defend the capital at all costs. Truthfully, Chinese authorities did not believe that Nanjing could be saved, but they maintained a confident facade for symbolic and political reasons. Meanwhile, in preparation for the worst, remaining Western nationals established a demilitarized refugee area for Chinese civilians called the Nanking Safety Zone. Although they could not convince Japan to officially recognize the safety zone, Japanese officials ensured them that they would not attack civilians in non-military areas of the city. 
On December 11th, 1937, all-out fighting began in Nanjing City. Despite the immediate losses to the Chinese army, commanding officer Tang Shengzhi refused to surrender and reiterated to Chinese newspapers China's determination to defend the city to the, to the bitter end. However, that same evening, he fled the city. Many of his troops followed and the 150,000 strong Chinese garrison collapsed. Nanjing quickly fell under Japanese hands. First, Japanese troops began slaughtering the remaining Chinese soldiers. Next, Western nationals began reporting to Japanese government officials cases of violence against civilians perpetuated by their soldiers. Lootings, arson, sexual violence, and killings persisted into January. Japanese field operations in Nanjing ended on February 14, 1938, so many historians cite late January or early February as the official end of the massacre. Nonetheless, while violence committed by Japanese soldiers gradually subsided, it existed until the end of Japanese occupation in Nanjing. The surrender of Japan in 1945 ended the Second Sino-Japanese War and the Second World War. It also brought to an end the public memory of the Nanjing Massacre in China. Immediately after Japan's surrender, the Communist and Nationalist parties resumed their civil war. Rather than push for the remembrance of their recent struggles against Japan, each party's leader prioritized defeating the other. Even following the Communist Party's victory in 1949 and the subsequent establishment of the People's Republic of China or PRC, the Nanjing Massacre remained absent in Chinese historiography as the government feared that memories of the atrocities would hurt its image of national strength. But in 1982, when Japanese newspapers reported that newly government approved textbooks had sanitized Japan's war record, outcries spread beyond the nation's borders and led the Chinese government to officially condemn the Japanese government for distorting and erasing the atrocities perpetuated by the Japanese army. Following the international uproar, the new Ch Japanese primary sources, including personnel diaries and official military records were released to the public. A number of Japanese veterans began confessing to the cruel acts that occurred in Nanjing as well. Because such harrowing and eye-opening information had become available, scholarly works on the Nanjing massacre proliferated. However, much of the scholarship centers on disputing the extent of the brutalities, and there's an emphasis on Chinese victimization over resistance. This narrative of suffering means that there's little nuance in discussions of Nanjing women's experiences. Instead, their experiences are reduced to and defined often by sexual violence. In order to add women's agency to scholarship on the women in the Nanjing massacre, my research challenges these one-dimensional portrayals of women and the ways they experienced the massacre by asking, how did women react to the threats of sexual violence from Japanese soldiers during the Nanjing massacre? And did women actively resist sexual violence? And if so, how? My research draws on a rich pool of primary sources, including diaries, personal letters, news reports, and diplomatic records. However, Chinese written records are scarce since Chinese leadership fled Nanjing before the onset of the massacre. So most records were written by Western nationals, much of it in English and mainly to document the incidents that occurred. But relying solely on these written documents limits the scope of women's experiences to Western perspectives. It also forgets the Chinese population that lived outside of Nanjing's urban space since foreigners did not venture beyond the city's walls during the massacre. Furthermore, few Chinese women were literate, so women's written sources are sparse. So I look towards the Showa Foundation's Visual History Archive's testimonies to understand women's experiences in their own words. I examined all 59 testimonies from Chinese women in the archive. They were conducted between 2012 and 2017. So as with all oral histories, there is a problem of the reliability of memory. However, a careful study of the women's testimonies in conjunction with written primary sources and, test and 
with in conjunction with written primary sources illuminates many commonalities within women's experiences. Many of the sources from the Nanjing massacre are imbued with violence against women. So the violence that women endured often become their entire story. With these testimonies, I chose not to focus on the details of the violence, but on capturing the agency of the women. I hope to reproduce their voices. And in this presentation, I'm going to share two such women's voices. Chen Fenying caught her first glimpse of Japanese soldiers in early December 1937 when she was 12 years old. They were crossing a river, marching towards her home in Shibei village. That day, Chen ran to evade capture as Japanese soldiers, upon setting foot in the village, began chasing after her and her two sisters. They ran into the wheat fields and hid until it was safe to return home at night. Later, their father dug a hole for Chen and her sisters to hide in. One day, a Japanese soldier stepped directly onto the wooden board. As, as he felt something underneath him, he poked the board with his knife and found the three sisters. He ordered, he ordered them to come out, but the sisters had prepared for a situation like this. As Chen relates in her testimony, we, the three of us, were ready to jump, to run towards the water. We ran towards the ditch and jumped into, the into it together. The Japanese did not dare to swim. After they had escaped, they ran into the wheat fields again and did not come home until later that night. The Chen sisters shaved off their hair soon afterwards. We were girls. The Japanese looked for girls. We shaved our heads like boys so they could not tell, she said in her testimony. They also stained their faces. Dirt on the ground or ashes from the bottom of a pan, we put that on our faces so no one could tell what we looked like. With her shaved head and dirty faces, Chen and her sisters said goodbye to their home and crossed the river once more. They ran from village to village, finding places to hide along the way. As she reflected back, she revealed in her testimony that the Japanese chased us, but they could not catch us. We were too fast. Zhang Shouhong's testimony also began in a wheat field. Japanese soldiers had set fire to 11-year-old Zhang Shouhong's home the day after they arrived in her village. Without shelter or possessions, Zhang turned to the fields that covered the countryside. She dug a ditch and lined its bottom with straw. To sleep, she covered herself with more straw. That was how she spent numerous nights in the wheat fields. In the daytime, Japanese troops would search for girls. In response, Zhang recalled how girls would smear their faces with ashes. She also recalled numerous close encounters with Japanese soldiers. For a while, she hid in a large straw pile with other girls. When one of the younger girls inside the pile accidentally revealed herself to a wandering soldier, the soldier grabbed his bayonet and stuck it into the straw. The bayonet slashed off the tip of Zhang's finger, she remembered, but she remained still. The other girls, however, panicked and scrambled out of the pile as Japanese soldiers chased after them. Zhang stayed hidden in the pile and waited until the soldiers were gone. She had survived a close encounter. Zhang Shouhong's village was next to a large river where many boats were abandoned because of the war. Getting to the boats required stepping into the water, so Japanese soldiers avoided them, according to Zhang. As a result, girls hid there during the day. Zhang joined these girls on the boats after the straw pile incident. One day, Japanese soldiers spotted from land a girl hiding on the same boat as her. The Japanese were afraid of water, she recounted, so soldiers took their machine guns and shot at the river's direction. She avoided the bullets by jumping into the water as soon as the soldiers had raised their guns. But of the 70 or 80 girls who hid on the boats, only three, including Zhang, survived. They too had jumped into the water after noticing the soldiers, only swimming back to shore after they had left. After she cut off her hair, afterwards she cut off her hair and started wearing boys clothing. With her short hair, 
and new dress, she was mistaken for a boy by Japanese soldiers. They forced her to carry their rifles. When they stole items from homes, they handed it to her to haul. When she could not keep up, the soldiers would poke her back with their guns and covering it with a mass of lumps that would remain on her body for the rest of her life. They humiliated and exhausted her, she said, for her life was safe as, a, as she was a boy. They never fired their guns at her, and most importantly, they never discovered that she was a girl. Despite the common narrative in Nanjing massacre literature of Chinese women as passive sufferers, the aforementioned stories demonstrate that women did, did not surrender to a fate of violence and death. Rather, it was in this lawless state that women like Tin and Zhang sought resistance from threats of sexual violence in its various forms. Their testimonies reveal that women undertook a common journey of resistance, which I have separated into these three steps right here. Many testi every testimony mentioned at least one of these three steps and many described, um, many described undertaking all three. First, women hid in paystacks, holes, wheat fields, abandoned boats, attics, and temples. Interestingly, they also often mentioned jumping into rivers and lakes when Japanese soldiers were approaching, as there seemed to be a common sense that Japanese soldiers either disliked or were scared of water, so they avoided it. Next, women smeared their faces with dirt and ashes to maintain um, an undesirable appearance. Many younger women shaved their heads and wore boys' clothing. Older women sometimes disguised themselves as elderly women too. Finally, with these disguises, many women escaped into the walled Nanjing City's refugee area. To sum up, I've from the studying the testimonies, I have three main conclusions. First, women actively resisted threats of sexual violence through a common set of practices. Second, the dominant narrative of Western nationals rescuing women and women remaining passive victims ignores the nuances of the limitations of Western nationals authorities and the voices of women. And third, by filling gaps in literature with women's own voices through oral history, we can begin to reproduce historical narratives with women's agency in mind. And uh, finally, before I conclude my presentation, I'd like to thank my faculty advisor, Dr. Wolf Gruner for inspiring me to pursue this research in resistance. I'd also like to thank the USC Shoah Foundation for providing me the opportunity to spend the summer researching in the Visual History Archive. And um, last but not least, I'd like to thank everyone here for watching my presentation. So thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy. If we were all together, everyone would be applauding. So I'm going to applaud on everyone's behalf. What a fascinating topic and so exciting that you're exploring these testimonies. So to the audience watching, if you have questions about Lucy's presentation, about the Nanjing testimonies, feel free to raise your hand by clicking raise hand or use the Q&A feature or type your questions into the chat and the demo is gonna help to moderate the, um, the discussion period. Yeah, I can see one question actually already coming in into the Q&A section. Uh, Emily Suarez is asking, why were the Japanese soldiers afraid of water? That's an interesting question. Um, I don't know either because every testimony kind of gave a different answer either that they were afraid of water or they didn't know how to swim or they didn't want to bother with getting their equipment wet so it could be a combination of those three factors um it's definitely something that's interesting that i didn't see in written sources um so it's something that yeah i feel like could be explored further thank you lucy any other questions? Maybe I'll ask a question while people are pondering their own questions. I'm curious about how you approached defining resistance. And I noticed that the examples of how you define it really focus on that time period and the actions, the behaviors that people took at that time. 
And I wondered whether um, there's room in your conception for the fact that the, these women are talking about this very difficult topic in recorded testimonies, whether that might also be construed as a form of resistance to what they endured. Yeah, I definitely think that sharing their stories is a form of resistance because it keeps these stories and the events in public memory. And um, as for how I define resistance while I was doing my research, um, I, I was actually inspired by Dr. Wolf Gruner's article about resistance and expanding the definition of resistance since it's often studied as group or armed organized activities. Um, but so uh, he expanded it in his to define it as deliberate individual actions as well against the state. And so I've expanded my definition to to look at different forms of self-preservation as forms of opposition to the intentions of the Japanese soldiers. Um, so at the most basic level from my research, the testimonies show that the resistance were actions for self-preservation um, and the, dis the protection of oneself from harm and destruction. Um. Lucy, there is one other question. I was about to ask mine, but I need to defer mine. Uh, so it's for Sayantani. Um, she says, great presentation. Uh, she's wondering about women with children. How were they escaping or hiding from Japanese soldiers? Um, she assumes it would have been very difficult to escape or hide if one had children. Did you come across any testimonies or sources that mentioned this? Thank you, Sayantani. Yeah, so since the testimonies were filmed in 2012 to 2017, um, many of the women in the testimonies were younger women um, during the Nanjing massacre. So they were around 10 to 15 years old. Um, so there, I haven't found testimonies from mothers, but um, there are descriptions from these, from the, from um, the women talking about how their mothers would lead them to hide or their mothers were the ones who told them to um, shave their heads or to rub dirt on their faces. So um, from these, I would say, yes, it was very difficult to escape with children, but um, it seems like from the testimonies that the women always put their children first and um, would always ensure that their children were safe by sending them to the refugee camps and um, making sure that they were safe. Great, and that kind of also answers my question that I had. So <laughs> thank you, say Anthony. I see that Walt has a raised hand. Oh, Walt, uh, can you please unmute yourself? Yeah, thank you, Lucy. Uh, and I think this is such an important research uh, because when we think about the last 10 years in genocide studies, there is, uh, a lot written about uh, sexual violence uh, as part, uh, as an essential part of genocide and mass violence. Uh, but as you rightly pointed out in the beginning, when it is emphasized, then it's usually more about the violence itself as a tool of the perpetrators. And uh, there is not much exploration about the women themselves. Would you think that your research is uh, applicable also to other cases of mass violence and genocide? that uh, they are also, when there is mass rape and mass uh, sexual violence, that uh, we, if we explore this further, we would find a similar agency among women as in your case. Yeah, I, I definitely think so, because um, from my experience researching, there is just this common conception that women were um, these passive victims and that there wasn't really anything that they could do against these Japanese soldiers. So if, um, so if we look at other kinds of events like this, then I feel like there, it is something that should be studied of how women experienced the massacre them and how um, they resisted because it is something that's overlooked and um, that people automatically assume from these sources of violence that there were no resistance involved.
Adama, you're on mute. I'm sorry. Uh, we have another hand. Uh, Charles Kaplan raised a hand. Uh, so let me just um, enable. Okay. All right. All righty. I think you should be able to speak now. Okay. Yes, thank you for this uh, presentation. It was really uh, great. I, I was wondering, um, in, in the testimonies, did, did you notice any uh, patterns in terms of the future with these women? They experienced, uh, uh, they experienced this uh, great uh, uh, post-traumatic stress, you might call it. And, uh, and did, what was the consequences of this in their further lives? Did you notice any, uh, any uh, patterns in terms of, uh, of, of the, what happened after the massacre and, and uh, a, a, after the, the war and on, on forward in their lives and with their, with their own families? I noticed um, from studying the testimonies that a lot of the family members that were with the, with the women were hearing about it for the first time too. So um, I think that from this, I feel like a lot of women hid the events that would have happened, that probably happened to them. Um, I know a lot of them were reluctant to tell their personal stories. Um, a lot of them would say, I know of this sexual assault that happened or my neighbor, something happened to my neighbor, but they never really talked about themselves. So um, it's definitely something that I feel like was not really, they didn't uh, talk about out loud. Um, and as for the effects that these events have had on them, um, I would say that I have noticed that there is this reluctance to tell the stories um, and that, yeah, yes, they are like holding, I feel like still a lot of things inside that they haven't shared yet. Thank you, Lucy. That's, it, it's also fascinating the way in which this topic and this conversation speaks to our lectures in recent weeks about sexualized violence during the Holocaust. So my brain is making sort of notations about ways in which what you're describing aligns with what we've heard and then ways in which it's distinctly different. So thank you so much for bringing this perspective. Are there any final questions about Lucy's presentation? All right. Well, thank you so much, Lucy. Um, Padema, do you want to read that one? Yeah, of course. Um, let me just pull it up. Um, so, Sayantani has more of a suggestion than a question. Uh, she says, in my studies of rape during the Indian uh, partition, I came across several accounts of the Indian government carrying out discrete abortions after the partition, which they termed as cleansing. I wonder if this is seen in the case of the Nanjing massacre too in the aftermath, especially given the narrative of shame around the sexual violence. Yeah, thank you for the suggestion. Um, it's not something that I've thought about but yeah, that is, that is a fascinating thought that I want to explore because um, there, I know women didn't talk about children, um, like the possibility of these pregnancies um, wasn't brought up, but it's something that I think should be explored too. Okay, thank you, Lucy, and thank you to the audience for engaging with that presentation. Congratulations again on a really important project. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Rachel Zaretsky. 
Rachel Zaretsky is an artist born in Miami and lives in Los Angeles. She holds a BFA in Visual and Critical Studies from the School of Visual Arts in New York, and she's currently an MFA candidate in art at the USC Roski School of Art and Design. She works through performance, video, and photography to challenge our relationship to the creation of collective memory. She has participated in a number of national and international exhibitions, performances, and screenings. Last summer, she participated in the first virtual exhibition of the Los Angeles Municipal Art Gallery. The exhibition presented works by Los Angeles-based artists that examined the archive as a conceptual vehicle. Her work was entitled Visiting the Holocaust Memorial Miami Beach by Proxy and some Googling of that might, might lead you to, the, uh, to, the, to her work, Visiting the Holocaust Memorial Miami Beach by Proxy. Her thesis exhibition, Walking Along the Memorial Wall, will be opening in May 2021 at USC's Arts District Gallery. So please join me in welcoming Rachel Zaretsky. Thank you, Martha. Um, I'm just gonna pull up my presentation now. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to the center for having me and uh, thank you to Lucy for sharing your research. Um, as Martha mentioned in my work, I look at how collective memory is constructed and also the role of memorials and monuments in our culture. I'm particularly interested in the social life of these sites, how visitors engage with and activate memory, and what gets produced by visitors of these sites. Uh, when learning about the Shoah Foundation and the Visual History Archive through a media studies course I took, I was really thrilled to learn of this vast resource at the school because um, I was unaware of it when applying. And I view archives um, akin to memorials as places of memory. I was unsure of the possibility of an artist being accepted to the fellowship, but I felt like my research-oriented practice was a good fit. And I hope to build relationships with institutions and create works uh, responding to them in the future as well. Uh, once becoming uh, initiated and uh, navig with na navigating the archive and being given a warm welcome, I started exploring. Um, there are so many survivors in this archive, it can be really daunting. And um, I initially thought I would be, uh, begin with watching uh, the testimonies of Holocaust survivors who mentioned the village Ostra Mazwika. Uh, apologies for my pronunciation. Um, this Polish village is where a lot of my family was from and their fate is unknown. And I thought perhaps exploring testimonies of those who mentioned it could be um, a path towards some resolution. Um, once searching, I discovered though that the mention of this village is quite limited and there was a language barrier. The first testimony that I did watch though was the story of Gideon Hirschberg. Uh, from that position, I felt um, I should sort of pivot and step back and think more about um, the specific role of video testimony, uh, what it holds uh, as opposed to oral history testimony. Uh, as a visual artist, I'm positioned to be observant towards all of the information and image that can be understood and decoded. And I decided to really um, experiment and play with uh, the archives indexing term choices as a method of exploring and uh, discovering new testimonies that felt relevant or interesting. Um, I found myself looking for uh, sensorial cues such as testimonies that mention taste, smell, touch, and pain. And then I nar uh, narrowed my search from there. And when watching these testimonies, uh, I focused on the stories that the survivors were telling, but also on um, the unsaid language somatic language and how each of them express grief and trauma through body language. Uh, for these particular moments, uh, my note taking also took the form of recording myself reenacting these gestures. And um, I also found myself particularly intrigued by these moments of self-awareness when someone might allude to something 
through their body language, um, either that they thought the viewer might know or that it was too difficult to say. And these moments uh, kind of bring an awareness during the testimony to an anticipated listener. Um, after the fellowship, I was initially unsure of how to begin. Uh, this experience was overwhelming and it was a lot of information and difficult information to settle in me. And as an artist, I also felt particularly intimidated with creating a response due to the difficulty of the content. Um, there's definitely a challenge with uh, what it means to work with other people's stories. And the last thing I'd wanna do is to uh, flatten or extract from someone else's life story. But I knew I needed to start somewhere. Um, so I began to take into account what position I hold as a witness to witness testimony. I watched over a hundred hours of testimony in this period of a month. And, you know, these tapes are survivors telling their stories decades later. And um, I just wondered uh, or wanted to ask myself the question, how much do I remember? So uh, one month after the end of the fellowship, I sat down and I filmed myself in an effort to document everything I could recall from the experience in a single sitting. And I decided to turn this into a practice where I would make these videos consistently over a period of time. So I started in September and I made my most recent video um, about 10 days ago. And I view this as another form of research towards a work. I don't shy away from long-term projects and do this content and um, almost as a memory and testimony as part of the material. Um, I'm very interested in how this will evolve. Um, in this practice, um, yeah, I'm exploring how uh, memory evolves and um, is interpreted and also the process of memories of others becoming our own. And um, I'm going to share two of these clips now. They are unedited and um, definitely viewed as in progress, but I felt that they would really help uh, with this conversation. The way that I'm thinking about the testimonies is sort of um, in the time frame that I watch them. So I, I pursued, I watched testimonies for four weeks. So right now I'm thinking about stories that I uh, listened to and witnessed in the first week. I think that the next story that is really coming to mind is the story of Edward Herman, who um, was uh, a young, uh, was a child when in Poland when um, the war broke out. And um, I, I think it was him that ha had really focused on his relationship with his father. I'm not exactly sure, but I think I remember him talking a lot about being very close with his father and um, his father giving him a coat that lasted with him throughout the whole war. Um, his family thought it would be safer if they smuggled him to Hungary where um, the occupation had not begun just yet, uh, the German occupation. And he, w along with some adult men, were um, smuggled across the border, I think to like Slovenia or Serbia, I'm not exactly sure, but they made it to Hungary and he was um, placed with a family. And um, I think this was the plan all along to be in the care of his family. But um, things took a turn because the family had a son and the son was similar in age and I think wasn't too comfortable with having this boy, with having Edward there. And he brought him around Budapest to show him the town and brought him to a cafe where a lot of Polish Jews were, and then he left him there. And um, Edward described this moment as the most traumatic moment of his life because he suddenly felt um, he didn't know where he was, and as time passed, um, many of the people started collecting money for him, which he was told by his parents that you never take money from people no matter what, and he began to cry, um, unsure of what to do or where to go. 
and um, a woman took him in for one night from that cafe and he described how she gave him a bath and a place to sleep for one night and she also gave him cherries which um, he loved cherries so much and I think uh, because of the tension of this moment he, he described eating so many of them that it gave him diarrhea. The next day, um, he didn't stay with this woman any longer and he was on the street for some time and then he described being sent to an orphanage in a church, I believe. And at this time there was also, I think his aunt was in Hungary and potentially his mother and sister, but where was really unclear. And I remember him describing having dreams of his mother coming down the Danube River to find him and be reunited with him. After a certain point, um, there became um, a threat that those in the orphanage would be sent to concentration camps, and they started locking the doors at night of the um, church, and somehow he coordinated with his aunt to uh, meet him at the window, and she told him to jump out the window, and he did. Um, I think his mother and his sister were in a rural part of Hungary, and... Um, they were reunited. From here, I think if it, if it was Edward that had this relationship with his father, I think they had assumed his father was dead and that his father assumed that he and his sister and his mother had passed on. And some years later, maybe 10 years later, he discovered that um, his father had a new family and a new son in Israel which I think was very painful for him. Um, and um, I think they maintained the relationship to some degree after the fact, but um, I'm really not remembering where they relocated. Um, if he gave his story in Brooklyn or in Florida, I can't remember. Um, So that first tape uh, was four months after the fellowship, and the next tape I'm going to show is eight months after the fellowship. Um, the testimony that I watched immediately after was um, the story of Dario Gabay, who was a um, Greek Jew who was from uh, Salonika. And his story, he was a young teen when the war began, and um, he spoke about Salonika being a very vibrant city with a large Jewish population. And I think he was maybe 16, maybe 18 when the war broke out, and that um, initially his family was brought to a uh, concentration camp, I think in uh, Greece, but, and he sort of referred to it as a hotel compared to what was to come. Um, he was eventually transported to um, Auschwitz and was given the position of um, someone who was in charge of running the gas chambers, but an, at first he needed to go through a, um, I think it was like a 30-day quarantine, and um, eventually his, he, um, the role that he played was after um, the gas chamber was set off, uh, he and others would have to go inside and um, look for any valuables and move the bodies um, on a stretcher to the incinerator. He spoke of having to use a cane uh, to hook around the body's necks. And um, he was very vivid with his description of what um, that first experience was, stepping on a body and through trapped gas hearing like an audible sound and how he just wondered like, how am I going to survive this? How is my soul going to survive this? And then he did this motion um, like this that was uh, kind of about like um, referring to himself as needing to become a robot in order to survive. 
Um, I believe he and his brother were doing this job and um, they didn't necessarily feel lucky because it was pretty well known that after six months um, the camps would exterminate, um, I believe these are the Sonder Commando, um, they would exterminate them and bring in new people to replace them. And um, he, um, I think the person who was interviewing him was quite interested in his block number and his time uh, while at Auschwitz because he was there while um, some other prisoners were planning an uprising. Um, I think that the date was known and somehow it didn't uh, follow through, but that there was retribution, um, there was punishment for those or the block that um, was involved. So um, these are just two images of the survivors whose uh, stories I mentioned. And um, the, I view my position in this work as one of, uh, as a translator and a mediator. And I'm interested in pushing this work further to bring into focus and almost collapse time between the witness, uh, the witness to witness testimony and the witness to witness testimony, because I think uh, that's the direction I'm going in with this work. And I just wanted to say thank you for listening and I'm very uh, open and I welcome comments and feedback and questions. Rachel, thank you so much. Again, applause collectively from all of us. And Badema is going to uh, help with the Q&A on this. So, audience, if you have reactions, comments, questions, please um, put them in the chat or in the Q&A feature or use the raise hand button to ask a question on audio. I see there's already one question in the chat, so Badema, I will pass it over to you. Yes. Um, so another person with the same name. <laughs> I think it's uh, who I shared the link with. <laughs> yeah, uh, is asking, as time goes on and you record new videos remembering the testimonies, what do you notice happens with time? How do the stories evolve in your own memory? How does this inform your understanding of collective memory? Okay, well, uh, that's a lot. So I think um, as time goes on and I record new videos, I notice and I have to sort of sit with the difficulty and how uncomfortable it is to kind of pull. Um, I've also had experiences where I'm in the middle of telling one person's story and I realize I remember something I've forgotten from a previous testimony in that sitting. And those are the moments where I have to sort of think about, um, do I go back and just pause what I'm saying and bring it together? Um, how do they sort of fuse and Something I've also noticed is the stories that um, are most readily available do have very distinct and vivid imagery or moments um, where the, the survivor is talking about a very pivotal moment. You know, in the uh, craft of storytelling, giving uh, your listener uh, something to hold on to, something that's textural and vis visual, um, something that might situate them in, in their position. I think those are really powerful storytelling mechanisms and I can see how they have uh, left their imprint on me. And uh, I think also um, when I think about how this practice informs my understanding of collective memory, so much of, um, I guess the, uh, the known story of the Holocaust you know, also uh, is, can in some ways be a, specific timeline or uh, has been constructed into a um, detailed but a generalization. And a lot of the moments I've noticed that have stuck with me are very particular instances, um, individual moments that I, I hope that the, the form that this work takes can help add dimension to how they're remembered. I think also um, when we talk about testimony, there is a hierarchy of the, the primary source and all that comes after the fact. And I hope that yeah, 
this discussion of witness testimony um, in this context can uh, just be further elaborated on. Thank you. We have many questions coming in, but I have to be selfish <laughs> and just quickly uh, reflect on what you just said uh, about what we know about the Holocaust is uh, this very generalized narrative, but we get that narrative through different sources, right? That, that's how collective memory is built, you know, to uh, history that we, that we learn at schools, you know, to, to media, etc. cetera. Uh, so I'm wondering, like, what do you make of distinction between individual and collective memory in this case? Because what you've just shown us is your individual memory of uh, these narratives that individuals gave. So how that plays into, uh, you know, this collective memory uh, framework. Uh, sorry, I just needed to do this. No, it's okay. It's a very good question. I don't know if I have uh, the, the right answer or complete answer yet, because I almost feel like that's what I'm working towards is, is thinking about how um, multi-layered memory is and how this practice is kind of trying to collapse uh, in the individual and and uh, what we know as the collective and sort of parse it, um, break it down, deconstruct it a little bit and sort of play with these moments of connection and disconnection. So I almost think that's just something I'm gonna be asking questions about and working towards in my work for a long time. Thank you. Now I'm going to do my job and read all these questions. Uh, so, Adelina Hudson is asking, why do you wait uh, that specific time until you record? Also, do you take notes when watching testimonies or jot down names or do you recall it all from memory? Yeah, so initially I told myself I would make a video once a month for an undetermined period of time, maybe six months, maybe a year. And I made them consistently for four months and then just I, I reached a point where I started thinking about the way that I've been um, conducting these uh, video recordings. I was sort of structuring it, thinking about four weeks and beginning with the first testimony I watched sort of then first week, then second week, third and fourth. And after just some discussion with a friend, I realized that's not how memory works. And it made me want to think about what would it mean to make a testimony where I just sort of begin with what comes to mind and how, um, frightening that is and you know what, what it how to, how to structure it and I took a bit of a pause and then I uh, started again I'm thinking now I, I could easily see myself continuing this until through the summer so perhaps one year of this practice you know I'm not exactly sure more and I, it's it's up for debate right now and um, the other part of the question the way that I uh, address taking uh, watching testimony and research I had uh, a notebook where I made a certain sort of a profile of each person I watched so that I could keep a record. Uh, I also uh, worked with imagery. I, I, I sort of played around, mostly taking notes, some video recording of myself, some screenshotting, some drawing. Um, and I, I just felt it was important to, at, during the process of the fellowship, make very distinct lines between people. And then now in this position, um, it's definitely um, the barriers of my memory are a lot more fluid. Thanks. I will read one more question from the chat. And I know that Walt has his hand raised. Um, so Jack Abramovich is asking, have you considered recording the same story at different time intervals and comparing how you remember that individual's narrative, such as once at four months, another at eight months? Yeah, I definitely have. I actually was debating for this talk if I should uh, focus on a single story and just uh, include two different versions of my videos of that person. You know, I'm still not sure yet if um, the presentation of this is showing um, trains of thoughts of individuals and how their what I remember of them has changed, or if it will be uh, organized by just time. So that's something that I think I'm very open to in terms of how this gets structured. Thank you. Wolf, you have a question. Yeah, uh, thank you, Rachel. Uh, uh, so my question uh, 
goes uh, a little bit into when you retell these stories and these narratives. Um, I wonder, I, are you trying to retell all the stories? Are you trying to just recollect what you remember? And how is this influenced? Uh, what can you say about this? Um, are these, uh, is this kind of triggered by, for example, uh, recollections of body language in the testimony? What has gender to do? Because you uh, uh, gave us two male examples, but how much is there uh, kind of plays gender role? Um, is the, do you see changes in your retelling, uh, remembering, uh, influenced also not just by uh, your recollections of uh, witnessing the testimonies, but also from current environments, like politics or anything. Yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll try to address all of your questions. The first one, um, I find myself, or the sort of task in hand that I gave myself a sort of a proposition is that in a single sitting to think of how much I could remember and the way that the testimonies and uh, or these video in, uh, interviews I create of myself, um, I definitely find myself focusing on uh, testimonies where I, I feel like I can remember a full picture, which to me includes uh, their name, uh, where they're from, a little bit about before and after the war, and then maybe some mention after the fact. And as the time goes by, I, I do include any like, uh, little fragmentary pieces to the best of my ability, but I don't want them to be um, too disjointed. And then I've also found myself over time um, telling, uh, telling different versions, different, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely changing. And the number of how many I think, I think this latest tape, I took almost the same amount of time as the others, but I spoke of fewer people, which is interesting. I'm not quite sure if I actually did in fact remember more information or if just the way that I'm telling has changed. And um, I decided to share two testimonies today. My goal was to think about having 10 minutes of video and I wanted to make sure that I shared two examples where I, I didn't um, cut any version of it. So people who I could say their whole story in five minutes or less. And that's how I uh, chose the two people who I decide to share. I definitely, a one testimony that I considered sharing was of a woman who I share, to me, I think the very obvious reason why she stays um, so vivid in my memory is that she's from Poland and looks and dresses very similar to my great grandmother, my late great grandmother. And how um, I, each time I bring up that connection, I can even see in my face how I change when I talk about her. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember your other two questions right now. <laughs> I know one of them had to do with, or you, you can, if you are able to uh, bring them up again, it would be helpful. Yeah, so one was about uh, body language. Uh, this uh, is something what triggered uh, memories uh, or your recollections and the other one kind of current environments and shaping your narrative? So I think definitely the body language. Um, and for me, as I shared um, in the beginning of my presentation, noticing uh, and sort of trying to understand decode that, that type of language really stuck with me. And I made sure I wrote a lot of notes about those people who, whose uh, gestures communicated another layer to their stories. I think when I think of Dario Gabay, the man whose story I, I shared, I always think about him doing this gesture. And that for me is um, a touchstone in how I think of his life story um, is, is that gesture. I, I also think of when I tell certain um, test, the retell testimonies, often there is a phrase that is not of my own language that always appears. Like for example, uh, there's a story uh, the Gideon Hirschberg, the first testimony that I recounted, he uses the phrase mother tongue when referring to his uh, first language. And I always say it, but that was not, that's not my language, uh, not, not uh, natural or native to me. 
And so I think there are certain moments, whether uh, from understood from the body or, or how someone tells their story that um, everything else is situated around when I think of retelling. And um, as far as uh, current contextual uh, elements brought into what I make and how I understand it, is that what you mean? And yeah, if, if you uh, realize that uh, your environment also uh, has an influence on your storytelling. Uh... Yeah, I mean, the immediate environment as far as uh, the image that I create, I know that um, I was interested in staging uh, my videos in a domestic space that felt akin to um, the testimony videos I watched. And um, I definitely understand how the scene is is like a stage. I think um, I tried not to be too um, strategic with everything at this moment because I am trying to see these as uh, in process or another form of research. I don't know yet if within this footage uh, the final piece is located, but I do think that's something I'm gonna take a lot more into account in uh, the final version of, of what I decide to share publicly. Thank you both for your questions. Um, we have a somewhat related question in the chat also uh, regarding gestures uh, from Chaya Novi. I'm, I hope I'm not mis mispronouncing this. Um, she is interested in hearing more about your findings regarding the um, gestures associated with those keywords you use to search the archives and how they are or aren't related to the way that you remember the stories. Uh, and she's adding that she thinks that her question was already answered, but if you have anything to add, be, please be free to do so. Yeah, I, um, I, I do think that there's, some, there's definitely an aspect of um, these gestures and these keywords that I wonder or I, I'm thinking at this moment will be how I construct a final piece. Um, just also taking cues from understanding what sits with me, noticing what elements of a story and uh, the video testimony I watched were powerful enough to um, really be held on to and to want to reproduce that somehow in, in what I choose to make and share with future uh, witnesses to the witness of witness testimony. I think your project is really fascinating for me and for others who I know are present who engage a lot with testimony in terms of provoking questions about what is it that we remember? Um, how do we represent that? And a lot of us um, might represent that in scholarship and your approach and also then the ways that that is gonna get circulated. Um, there's so much that speaks to the testimonies themselves. I think it's a, a really intriguing project. I just wanted to offer that comment. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience or comments? Okay, well, thank you, Rachel. I will applaud again collectively for everybody. And uh, I'll pass it over to Wolf to offer closing remark. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Lucy, uh, for these really uh, intriguing presentations. And I think also the audience for uh, uh, joining us today. And I think it uh, was really clear how in very different ways, how creative these uh, um, uh, research uh, endeavors uh, were. And um, I think what we really underestimate is that these fellowships enable a kind of a long-term uh, relationship and uh, engagement with the testimonies. And I notice uh, Lucy uh, will uh, probably publish on her research, which is also extraordinary for an uh, undergraduate student. And Rachel, you already said that there might, uh, you don't know how long you will work on this. Uh, so this is also kind of uh, way into the future and to determine. And, um, uh, and I think we are really, um, uh, interested in what the final outcome is, although you not 
example, you are not yet know it is. And we have already um, uh, a very uh, fruitful, uh, um, uh, what can I say, experiences with art and in and how art engages uh, testimonies because we had another fellow who uh, actually published recently a whole volume with po uh, poems uh, uh, following his engagement with the testimonies. So I think that's a very fruitful relationship too. And we are looking forward to either the academic or the artist, uh, the uh, artistic kind of uh, uh, results of this um, residency, uh, which we th thank Beth and Arto Lev uh, for uh, that they enabled this uh, uh, every summer. So thanks to everybody. We uh, I hope you will join us uh, for our next um, talk. Um, if you want to uh, see what else is happening, please uh, go to our website and subscribe to our newsletters. And there you will also be informed about potential uh, 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 publications and other results of this work. Thank you very much and have a, a great rest of the day. And thank you for the presentations, Rachel and Lucy again. And Marta and Badema for kind of organizing everything. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm just going to let the chat run for a moment here at the end, but thank you for coming. <laughs>